of a few things that um, we'll look at as far as an introduction to the Pentateuch first. <clears throat> I don't plan on having any quizzes or things like that in class, um, but I will try to before each of the tests, review with you on some things. Oh, I didn't give you, let me see here real quick what that shows. Oh, it does show you the tests. So September the 29th, end of this month is the first test. So there will be four tests throughout the semester. All right, as far as the introduction to the uh, Pentateuch, <clears throat> we're going to look at a number of uh, pretty basic things about the Pentateuch first. Um, as I mentioned, the Pentateuch is foundational to all of Scripture. And so I believe that's why the Bible just over and over and over says, Who wrote it? Moses. I mean, you can't be any more obvious. I, I know there's a lot of books in the Bible that don't list their author. The book of Job, for example, doesn't list its author. But the, the five books of Moses... Hello, I mean, that's one of the names of the books. Over and over and over and over and over, give us the name of the author in those five books, right after those five books, and then for thousands of years after that, 1,500 years after that, people kept saying, yeah, the books of Moses, yeah, Moses and the prophets. Jesus said, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, even, <laughs> I'm thinking of the... the the poor man in hell, I'm sorry, in heaven, and the rich man in hell, and the poor man said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. I mean, every, even people in heaven know <laughs> that Moses wrote it. And so that should be to us a very solid foundation. We don't have to be in any way ashamed to say that Moses wrote the books of the, of the Pentateuch. So, the Pentateuch is so foundational to all of Scripture and is the most important section in the Bible. I think in the New Testament, the foundation of the New Testament, of course, is the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, that sets up the church age, does it not? That sets up the foundation for the church. And then for a long period of time after that, and I say a long period of time, there's a lot of books after that in the New Testament, then that set up the foundation even more for the church. Paul's writings. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into it here, but Paul is the New Testament Moses. You know, Moses set up the, the, the system for the temple, for the worship in the temple. Paul sets up the system for the, the, the worship in the church and the church age. By the way, the church age is so far is, is already four or five hundred years longer than the age under the law. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, we've been living in the church age. So it is, in that sense, even, it's, it's better. <clears throat> So, just as knowledge of the four Gospels is essential to understand the New Testament, the Pentateuch is foundational and essential in understanding the Old Testament. Obviously, if you don't have that, uh, you, there's a lot of things you're missing. Um, <clears throat> from Exodus chapter 20 or so, through the rest of the Old Testament, and even into the New Testament, it covers the time period under the law. From Exodus 20 back to Genesis chapter 1 covers a time period, obviously, of about 2,500 years where they did not live under the law. So when you think of that, you've got 2,500 years, approximately, and this is before the law, 1,500 years, approximately, under the law, and now 2,000 years since then, in the church age, after the law. So the Pentateuch, <clears throat> this, I'm sorry, the Pentateuch was written about this time period, but uh, it sets up the system for this short 1,500 years. Let me give you some names for the Pentateuch. 
some names for the Pentateuch. I told you it'd be foundational. How many names do you think there are for the Pentateuch? Obviously, the Pentateuch is one. How many names? I have almost 10 names. So let's start with the Pentateuch. <clears throat> Pentateuch. All right, it comes from uh, two words. It comes from two words. Penta means five, obviously. And then tuk, pentateuch. <laughs> tuk means uh, rolls or scrolls or books, what we would think of as books. So five rolls. They actually, in the, in the Jewish Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, the, the Pentateuch, the whole thing was one scroll. So Moses, the books of Moses were one book, one big scroll. Or considered one. Let me give you some other names. <clears throat> it's also called the Book of the Law. The Book of the Law. I'm going to uh, be looking at a, quite a few references here. If you want to follow along, that'd be fine. Joshua chapter 1. Go to the book of Joshua. There's quite a few. Good number here in the book of Joshua. <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. You know the verse probably. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. We love to use that verse, don't we? We like to teach it to our bus kids. This book of the law shall not depart out of the... Well, what was that referring to? All they had were the five books of the law, the, the books of Moses. And uh, how much time do you spend meditating in the books of Moses? <laughs> Now, we always apply that to the entire Bible, and I think that's the right to do that. But when, when Josiah, the king, found the scroll of the books of Moses in the temple, and he read them, he rent his clothes and said, Oh my goodness, you know, God's going to destroy us because we haven't been keeping this thing. All he, all he read there, I believe, he found the law. He found the five books of Moses. And, and it brought him huge conviction of sin. You know, they specifically said, wow, we haven't been making that offering. We haven't been obeying God here and here and here and here and here. So he had the books of Moses. They brought conviction to him. Anyway, it's called the book of the law in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It's also called the book of the law in Joshua 8, 34. Joshua 8, 34. Afterward, he read the words of the law. This is at Ebal and Gerizim. When they read the law to all the people, after he read all the words of the law, the blessings and curses according to all that is written in the book of the law. Now, we're not even talking about books yet, and that's a sidetrack, but they had a book, a scroll. They had a set of writings. Okay, When we think of a book here, that's, it's not this kind of a book. It's a different kind of a book. It's talking about a compilation of writings, compiled writings, <clears throat> according to all that is written in the book of the law. So that's a name for the Pentateuch as well. Another name is the book of the law of Moses. The book of the law of Moses. Joshua 8.31. Here's at Ebal and Gerizim. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses... You know, when the Bible critics, the source criticism says that Moses didn't have, I'm sorry, that the law wasn't written by Moses, it was actually written by these other individuals, even much later after Moses. I mean, you have to, you have to deny verses like this. Because it says here that as Moses commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones... 
Um, I don't have the passage where that is. Exodus 20, 24 is a reference that I'm seeing. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. The reference back to the, when Moses actually said that. Okay, so they knew that he said that and they had heard him say that and now they're following what he told them to do. And it was written in the book of the law of Moses. Try chapter 23 of Joshua. Joshua 23, verse number 6. Joshua 23, 6. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Now this is, this is right after, I say right after, when Joshua was still alive. This is probably about 20 years or so, 10, 20, 30 years after Moses had died. They had conquered most of the land of Canaan as far as the main points and, they, and the tribes had been split up into their, into their areas. And now they meet back together and Joshua is giving them a final instruction before he dies. And he told them, according to all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, he remembered, they all remembered, there was a book of the law of Moses. They had it. It was right there and they call it the law of Moses. The book of the law of Moses. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible calls, calls it simply the law of Moses. The law of Moses. What do we say? 1 Kings 2, 3. <clears throat> Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways to keep His statutes, His commandments, His judgments, His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. You know, the, the, what is it, the House of Representatives, I think it is, the United States, or is it in the uh, rotunda of the Capitol? I forget where it is, but somewhere in D.C., there's all these great authors of law engraved or, or drawings or whatever. And at the center of it is Moses. Okay? Our founding fathers believed that. And they said Moses was the author of the five books of Moses. Anyway, so it's called the Law of Moses. It's also called the Book of Moses, Ezra 6.18 and Nehemiah 13, verse 1. So Ezra, Nehemiah, that's about a thousand years after Moses had written the books of Moses. Ezra, Nehemiah were both around 450-ish or so B.C. I'll read one of them to you. Ezra chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse number 18, Ezra was a great preacher. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So the book of Moses, that's not the book of Jasher, as Joshua referred to a separate source somewhere, a book. It's not the book of the wars of the Lord. It's not... Uh, you know, the book of uh, writings of Josephus or anything else. It's the book of Moses. Moses put together, wrote a book, and uh, Ezra refers to that. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 1. By the way, when, when people are in sin, what did uh, these great preachers do? They, uh, they always came back to the law. You know, this is for the Jews. I understand that. So, this is Ezra and Nehemiah and Josiah bringing people back to the law. And a lot of other times, even Ahab came back to the law at one point in his life, later in his life. When, when, they, came, when they were in sin, they came back to the law and it was convicting to them. And so it's called the Book of Moses. I, I like that. A thousand years after Moses. Next, it's called the law of God, the law of God. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 28. The law of God. Yes, it's the law of Moses, but it's also the law of God. That tells us also that Moses was simply a tool, a writer, and that God actually gave him those words. I get tired of the arguments that Moses wasn't there for anything that happened in the book of Genesis. He wasn't there. He wasn't born until way into the book of, or a little ways into the book, not way into, but little ways into the book of Exodus. He wasn't around when 
Joseph or Jacob or any of that. I mean, he was 300 years after that. Well, this isn't just the law of Moses. Remember, this is the law of God. God's the one who gave Moses the rights. Now, I personally believe that Moses had some other sources. I do believe that. I believe he had some books to draw from, some records to pull from. But at the same time, if God wanted him to, to write down all these details and to know all these things that we find in the book of Genesis, and he was never there and God just simply gave... That's perfectly fine with me. God's capable of that, you know, as if I'm the authority to say what God's capable of. I mean, he's obviously capable of that. So this isn't just the law of Moses, it's the law of God who gave it to Moses. John, the uh, apostle, wasn't actually there at all those revelations in the book of Revelation either. All he did is saw these things, you know, that, were, that still haven't happened. Many of those things still haven't happened. So, anyway, I get tired of hearing, well, they didn't actually see that. They, how do they know all that happened? Well, God, <laughs> the law of God. It's also called the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord, Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Luke chapter 2. Oh, we jumped into the New Testament. Luke chapter 2, verse 23. Here's uh, Mary after Jesus' birth. Mary goes down to, or to Bethlehem, it'd be up to Jerusalem. She goes up to Jerusalem to uh, offer a sacrifice for the new baby. Go back to verse 22. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished. Oops, there it is again. The law of Moses. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written, this is in parentheses, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb should be called holy to the Lord. End of parentheses. So, she said, I have to do this according to the law of the Lord. Well, it had just been called the Law of Moses. And now she says, or they say, it's the Law of the Lord. The Law of the Lord. Now, the, another name for it. It's also called simply the Law. The Law. I, I like that. Now you say, well, it's, that's, that's pretty simple, pretty obvious. It is not a law. It is not a, another law. It's the law, the standard. <clears throat> Moses borrowed his law, some say. Moses borrowed his law from Hammurabi. I don't, care, I don't know where Hammurabi got his law. Okay? He might have stolen it from Moses. I don't know the time frames of Hammurabi, I guess, is before Moses, wasn't he? But I don't care what happened. Moses got his law from God. And if there's any, um, what do you call that, uh, any similarities, it's because Hammurabi's law in some, some cases was biblical or was right. It was right. Now, if you read through a lot of that, there's some that, that were pretty off the charts, you know, pretty ridiculous. What's that? It was just. It was just. Thank you. A lot of it was just. Maybe he had some spiritual influence from somebody. But I guarantee you, Moses didn't get his law from Hammurabi. You know, the Bible tells us where he got his law. And by the way, uh, that comparison to the New Testament still holds also. Just like Moses received his words from the Lord at Sinai, the Bible tells us that Paul went down into Sinai as well and received his revelation for the New Testament church era. All right, so it's called the law, the standard. I, I like it that our founding fathers put Moses at the center of those lawgivers because they knew that's not just any old law. That is the standard, the law. Next. <clears throat> I like this one because Jesus uh, was making a pretty good point with these. In Luke chapter 16, 
Well, this is, this is Jesus talking, but uh, this is the story of the, the rich man in hell. <clears throat> and I already mentioned it once. But uh, verse 31, here's uh, Abraham saith to the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear. I said a little bit ago, that was the poor man talking, wasn't it? It was Abraham in Abraham's bosom, Abraham talking to uh, the rich man. He said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them, in verse 29. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets. What is that? That's the Old Testament. That's the writings. There's Moses. He's not saying literally, Moses, the man. Let them hear what Moses... No, he's saying let them hear what Moses wrote. The books of Moses. Moses and the prophets. In Luke chapter 24, again, Jesus makes reference to this. Here's the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. Cleopas, and we don't know the name of the other one. In verse number 20. Seven it is, but uh, back before that a little bit. Um, Jesus is explaining to them, they didn't believe Jesus had been the Messiah. They said, how can he have been the Messiah? And so Jesus, they didn't know who he was, Jesus goes back into the Old Testament and reasons with them through, I believe, through many prophecies. It doesn't tell us exactly what he said, but he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded them in all the scriptures of things. Man, would I love to have been there. I want to hear this someday. Um, it says all the prophets. So he started at Moses and he said, okay, in the book of Moses, it said this was what was going to happen to the Messiah. I can just imagine he started at Genesis 3.15. You know, God said he was going to do this. He was going to send a Savior, a Messiah. And then on down through, he probably talked about the types of Christ and the lamb, that was, the lamb sacrifice that was instituted in Genesis, early Genesis already. And just on through, I'm sure he pointed out, I would imagine he pointed out these things. And then all the prophets... I believe that every single prophet has references and, and prophecies about the coming of Christ and what that would be like. I can just imagine he stopped at Isaiah 53 for quite a while. <laughs> you know, Isaiah said he was going to be beaten beyond uh, description, beyond recognition. Isaiah said these things. I mean, that only makes sense. Jesus was going to have to suffer. And that's exactly, ought not Christ to have suffered? He said that they all said he was going to suffer and then to enter into his glory. They said he's going to enter his glory. And of course, you know, he just, I'd love to hear this whole conversation. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. <clears throat> And, of course, we know the rest of that story. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Beginning at Moses and the prophets. So it's called Moses. The books of Moses are called Moses. And then lastly, this is the Jewish word for, Torah, or for the, the law, and that is the word Torah. Torah. T-O-R-A-H. Torah. All right, this is the Jewish name for the books of Moses. The word Torah means law, or teaching, or instruction. Law, or teaching, or instruction. <clears throat> the Jews, uh, or for the Jews, the Pentateuch contained an authority that the rest of the Old Testament couldn't quite match. The prophets and the writings didn't seem as important just as the importance of Moses exceeded any other Old Testament figure. Moses is, not to be silly, but he's the man in the Old Testament. He is the source, he's the foundation for the rest of the Old Testament. Not the source, but the foundation. 
When Jews were driven from their homeland in exile, the books of Moses were read regularly in the synagogue to the point of reading through them every three years. It was the Torah. It was the law. It's the book of instruction. Of course, in the synagogues, uh, that was, you know, we think of the synagogue, and there's really not a comparison between the synagogue and the church. Really, the closer comparison would be a synagogue and a school because they go in there and they would study the law. It was literally the law that was being studied, which is the books of Moses, the Torah. Um, any of you have seen a copy of, uh, not a copy, a scroll of the Torah? Anybody seen, anybody seen that in person? No? Uh, when we were in Israel, we got to see um, a, an actual Torah scroll. Uh, huge old thing, man. I'm glad I can you know, fit into much smaller. But you know, think of it this way. When we give people a Bible and we give them you know, a New Testament, that's, that's for the church age, okay? We give people an, a New Testament. Congratulations. In the Old Testament times, it wouldn't have been like that. No, they didn't have small... But if they had a small uh, book of the law... That is what they would have passed out. Is a little copy of the Torah. And if you can understand that same concept, we give out copies of the New Testament, they would have given copies of the law. That was their foundational scriptures. Okay, let me um, elaborate a little bit on the five divisions of the Pentateuch. <clears throat> Back to this meaning here, Pentateuch means five rolls or scrolls, five volumes. It's interesting, the Jewish Talmud, which is a, uh, a description, it's a book giving much more detail about the law. That's the best way I know. It's a manual on how the law should be applied. You know, you thought the book of Leviticus was hard to get through? <laughs> oh, you'd have a lot of fun with the Talmud. Um, the book of Leviticus just skims the surface of how these offerings were to be done, okay, compared to the Talmud. It skims the surface. <clears throat> but anyway, the Jewish Talmud describes the Pentateuch. They don't just say it's the law. It describes it in a funny way, but I think it's kind of uh, revealing. They describe the law as five, sorry, the Pentateuch as five fifths of the law. Five fifths. Okay, what does that mean? Sorry? The whole, everything. It's all the law. That is, that is it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that gives you an idea of how much they revere the law. Now, you look at it and you say, man, phew, book of Leviticus, man, I don't hardly ever read that book. You know, it's too boring. Numbers, Deuteronomy, oh, man, that gets... Oh, no. They revered that, those writings, literally to the point of, obviously, memorizing huge portions or all of it. Of every, so every few years, they would read all of it publicly. And on and on. I mean, it was, they revered it that much. The five divisions of the Pentateuch. <clears throat> um, another, th oh, uh, both the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch, which we'll talk about that later on. The Samaritan Pentateuch was a different, little, little bit changed version of the Pentateuch. Both the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch have five names for Moses' writings. Josephus spoke of the five books of the law. Okay? So I'm just pointing out that they all saw that there were five divisions in the law, the Pentateuch. Even the bad or horrible Origen spoke of the Pentateuch in his commentary on John, five parts of the, of the uh, Pentateuch. All right, so it's five divisions. It's five, but it's also one. And so let me just point out here that the Pentateuch is unified. <clears throat> Except for Genesis, the rest of the Pentateuch 
focuses on the life of Moses and his leadership of the children of Israel. So the four other books of the Pentateuch are Moses' life story in a large way and what happened and what was revealed to him and he wrote it down. Of course, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 12, I believe it is, that he was the most humble man on earth. You ought to write that about yourself. <laughs> so, you know, just write a book and say, you know, really, you're a shrock. Was the most humble person that ever lived on the earth. Literally, that's what he says. That's what it says. <laughs> um, there's other explanations for that. You know, who knows if he actually penned that. Um, anyway. Oh, what I was going to say, though. So these, these other four books are about Moses. Genesis is, is, of course, the history. And I believe that's why, in my opinion, that's why that uh, Moses had some writing, some books that he draw from, drew from, some records that he was pulling from. But they are unified. It's just a continual story of the history of mankind and then God's switching or changing. God, by the way, God does that several times in the books of the law. From Genesis chapter 9, before that time, God dealt with individuals. Chapter 10, 11 even, Book of Nations. Much more with individuals. Shem, he dealt with, not the one we know. Um, he, he dealt with, uh, I, 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 meant, I said Shem, I meant um, oh, Seth. I was thinking Seth. Enoch, Noah, Methuselah. Okay, God dealt with a lot of individuals. Then we see a switching gears and God begins to deal with a group, a family, a group of people. Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. And so for, for the rest of the time, most of the rest of that time, we see that family. And then the law is instituted in Exodus chapter 20. And a huge switching of gears. And of course that continues all the way until the, the temple veil was split at the death of Christ on the cross. So, anyway, but we see, I believe, just a nice unity continuing all the way through the book of the books of the law, the Pentateuch. Let me mention that the Pentateuch uh, had a great impact on the rest of the Old Testament. I have to stop at eight, or I'm sorry, at 9.50, right? 9.45. Okay, then I will, I will stop right there. So uh, we'll pick up with the impact of the Pentateuch on the Old Testament and on the New Testament. It's just uh, continually being used and referenced throughout the rest of the Bible.